Follow us on social media and please hit the subscribe button so you don't miss out on any updates from our ALS experts. All right, folks. How do you like that? Another Wednesday evening with probably all the information that you want to know. Part of that's going to be here tonight. So listen to what you hear and then come up with your questions because that's going to extend the information that we're all going to receive. So to your living room, to our living room, welcome everybody. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here tonight with us for our ALS talk series. We are so honored to have the amazing Dr. Merit Sakovich to join us tonight. She's going to present on new therapies for ALS. I'm Lisa Deegan and I'm part of the Everything ALS team. Our entire team has been affected by ALS and we work really hard to bring you guys um, what we did not have while we were going through our journeys. I lost my younger brother, John, to this horrible disease in 2018. So um, before we introduce our, our wonderful guest tonight, we need your help to help accelerate treatments for ALS. Please sign up for our speech study at everythingals.org forward slash research and learn more about how we can end ALS together. Also, please check out our podcast stories and innovations in ALS and learn um, the stories of those affected and those are, who are fighting for good care and a cure for this disease. We actually just interviewed um, Dr. Sakovich last week and um, you can learn more about her dedication to study and care for people with ALS. Um, and it's on, it'll be on Spotify. Her, her episode will be on Spotify soon. So we're so grateful to have Dr. Merit Sakovich back on our Everything ALS platform to talk about new therapies for ALS. Dr. Sakovich is the chief of Massachusetts General Hospital Neurology Service director of the Sean M. Healy and AMG Center for ALS at Massachusetts General Hospital, and the Julianne Dorn Professor of Neurology at Harvard Medical School in Boston. She directs the Massachusetts General Hospital ALS program and is one of the founders and former co-directors of the Northeast ALS Consortium and is also leading the first platform trial in ALS. So please join me everyone in welcoming Dr. Merit Sakovich. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, McFinn and everybody. It's so great to be back here um, and um, to have a chance to talk about um, uh, what's new in ALS. And I, I know that you all know so much, and this is such a collaboration that I, I really tried to um, get my slides current uh, so that uh, we can really talk about some of the new things out there. Um, I also wanted to share today that I met um, a new, new family with ALS today, and they asked me, uh, what foundations were, would be good. And I said everything ALS and, and a few others, but uh, I, I think you. what you're doing is just amazing to bring the community together and uh, I'm very glad to be part of it. So Thank let you. me uh, share here and um, I have about 25 slides, but some of them are fast, but I hope to leave lots of time for Q and A. I see some good questions are coming in already. Okay, so I actually want to take a moment to talk about someone I know a lot of you guys know, and this is actually my first talk that I kind of doing in her honor, and that's Madeline Kennedy. And, and the reason why I was thinking about her today when I was preparing this, this talk is because she really changed how I practice uh, as a physician. I met her eight, eight years ago or so, and um, she's a nurse and uh, was a head nurse and a golfer and um, she actually is the one who convinced me about uh, uh, off-label prescribing uh, that, you know, that, you know, she wanted to take a chance and have her options. And uh, we tried a lot of things from off-label to expanded access. And uh, I wasn't doing that before, but she really taught me about that importance of having other options. Maybe, you know, back then there weren't a lot of trials um, and about um, letting, you know, giving opportunities to contribute to research in many different ways. And uh, as many of you know, she's a strong advocate speaking at, uh, at FDA meetings and government meetings, and uh, it's one of our early CRLI members. So um, I was thinking that she would really be proud uh, uh, of, of this meeting and, and my uh, talking about um, her impact on my uh, approach to taking care of people. So to Madeline. Mm -hmm. uh, 
so you know we we've made progress in the field but we have a long way to go but but i'm i'm so much more hopeful today than i was when i, I started out in in als that we're around the corner of having a lot of new treatments so we do have four on the market um but we have a lot of trials and they're all over the world um and as you know thanks to many of you on this call we have another drug uh, under fda review amx 0035 and i think that uh, that's just the beginning of having many more under regulatory review to get to market. So I do think it's really a hopeful time. Uh, so today I'll talk a little bit about what therapies are in the later stage of testing, but the ones that I think are closest to coming, uh, hopefully to market, uh, what the pipeline looks like, and then uh, just a little bit, I can't help myself, but to talk a little bit about the platform trial and update on where we are on that. And, uh, and, and also if there's people here who haven't heard about it, just to give a chance to talk a little bit about that approach. Um, so there's a lot going on. So this is, um, and I think the reason we have so much going on in ALS is because we understand the science better. Now, now we don't understand all of it. Uh, it's really quite complex, but we knew a lot more than we knew even like two years ago. And, and some of it was really actually driven, um, not to sound cliche, but by the ice bucket challenge money. It really came in a time where, you know, there were some initial breakthroughs in understanding the science and more people in the field but that combined with finally some resources really i think helped the field to just take off so the the challenge in, in ALS is that we know that there's many things going on in not just in the motor neuron but in the cells around the motor neuron and also in the periphery outside of the brain in the spinal cord in the blood and it's probably unlikely that if you just tackle one of these things that that uh, that you're going to get enough of a success. You might have to tackle multiple parts of this pathway. And that's you know, not that dissimilar to other illnesses like, like cancer. So the example we like to use that you know, some of the real cures from cancer came from combinations of treatments that e each one did something, but it wasn't until you really tackled many different pathways that you got huge success. And we saw that also in HIV with triple therapies. And I think we're gonna we definitely need that in ALS. It, it, until the day comes when we really, the scientists really identify the very first thing that might happen, then maybe you can get away with one drug, but I, I think we need combinations. But because we know about all these pathways, going on it's attracted a ton of, of companies who have drugs that tackle maybe one or two of these i'd say of, of the this list here we have drugs in either in in trials already or about to come in almost all of these pathways um, and so it does mean that we have to get clever or, or figure out how to do combination treatments um, uh, you know, better in a way that that's informative and start to develop you know ways to measure these different pathways in people um, but there's not a category here that doesn't have at least a couple companies working on it. Um, so that, again, gives me a lot of hope. So um, this is, this is a, it, this might not be a complete list. It's actually gotten very hard to, to, to get a complete list of drugs, but I did want to highlight a few things. So there's on the left here, um, six drugs that have finished their last stage of trial, what we call a phase three trial, where um, you're really looking, does it work or not? Is it safe? Is it ready to go to for approval? And uh, green is, is a go. And again, a, a just a huge shout out to all of you and, and other groups who have really advocated for the a change in our in the FDA, um, or at least uh, listen that that one trial might be sufficient for uh, approval. So this is, a, as, as people know, is a combination of Tudka and sodium phenobutrate. And uh, one of those drugs works on um, the pathway of uh, mitochondrial dysfunction. So that's uh, how your cells make energy. And the other one works in how uh, something called ER stress of how your cells make uh, proteins. And we know in from the diagram in the pre previous picture that both those pathways in the cell in the motor neuron are not working well. And so the idea of the, the company founders were that uh, if you could tackle both, maybe it'd be better than either alone. And that was true in the um, in the cell models and the animal models. Uh, and in the uh, trial in people, they, they didn't actually test that hypothesis. They didn't test Tudka alone and Bufano alone and the combo. They just tested the combo. But they saw a about a 30% slowing of the illness, about a uh, 11 to 12 month 
extension of life, which again, we want to do much more than that, but that's more than the other drugs that are out there and really not a lot of safety issues, some GI things, but, but in the big picture safe. So uh, as you know, it's under review in, in Health Canada for approval. It's under review in the US for approval. We don't know the date yet, um, but we should be hearing soon. So the FDA, when they accept a filing, they issue something called a PDUFA date, which is a date that they'll make their decision. Um, it's usually six months after the filing. Sometimes it can be faster. Um, the ones in blue, I, I put, I didn't put it yellow because yellow is kind of like a warning. I don't think it's a warning, but it's a more of a uh, not so clear, but not a clear negative, not a clear positive. Um, the first one is a gene therapy for SOD1 um, uh, ALS, and, and that phase three trial did not hit its primary outcome measure, but it it did, um, you know, in every measure look better on the treatment and perhaps in people with a slower form of the, that, that disease look, look pretty stable actually. Um, so, and then had a very large effect on a biomarker called neurofilament. It lowered that marker of, of neuronal injury by 50%, which we, we don't have any drug that did that. So, but again, it didn't hit on its uh, primary outcome measure. So it's, it's in this kind of blue zone, I guess. Neuron similarly didn't, this, that's a stem cell. You know, a, a lot of people know about neuron. It's a, a stem cell uh, trial uh, where you take people's own uh, stem cells from their bone marrow. Those, those cells usually become like your red cells or your white cells, but here they're used to deliver proteins that are anti-inflammatory and could be helpful. And in that phase three trial, also, it didn't, it didn't hit the primary outcome measure. And that means it, that you know, the two groups look the same. But in a post hoc analysis, there, there did seem to be a group, a subgroup who were perhaps earlier in the illness where there seemed to be some benefit. And they also had benefit on, bio, on biomarkers. So you know, what's going to happen to those two is not that clear yet. But there are obviously uh, ongoing discussions with the regulatory agencies about next steps. The three in red, unfortunately, it did not work. Um, and um, uh, one of them, levosimendin, was a drug that worked directly on the muscle to help the muscle contract a little better. And the thought was that it might help people's breathing, but that trial was negative. Ultimaris is an antibody against something called complement. So that blocks inflammation, one part of the inflammation pathway in the blood, and that was negative. And that goes back to this kind of point about um, you probably need more than one target. We know that if we look in the blood of people with, with motor neuron disease, that there's a lot of inflammatory changes, but it's not just one part of it, it's multiple parts. And you might need to attack more than one part. And then aromacomol also unfortunately was negative. So again, we can learn from these trials. We have to learn from these trials. And um, again, I'm more, more hopeful for the things in, in blue here. So the ones in blue are trials uh, that are active now. Um, so um, methylcobalamin, we're all waiting for the second trial results. The first trial, um, and this is uh, methylcobalamin is another name for a high dose B12. Uh, it's a type of B12. Um, and there was a study in Japan years ago where they did, uh, when they looked at everybody in the trial, they didn't see a benefit. But when they looked at a subset of people, um, a bit like the neuron story, um, they, uh, who, who had started the treatment relatively early in their disease course, they saw a very large benefit. So they repeated the study in that population, but, but, um, and that study is over. We just haven't seen the results, uh, but we're hopefully, hopefully they'll come out soon so we can know whether that worked or not. Um, I won't go through all these. I'll just say that um, the oral Adarabone one, that is Adarabone is a marketed drug IV. But um, there's two things that were important about it. One is in the initial trial, which showed a 33% slowing the illness, it was only given 10 days a month. And the FDA did ask the company to do an everyday study, thinking that they had not hit the maximal effect of this drug by giving it just 10 days. And so the company decided to do that with their oral drug uh, that, rather than IV. Um, um, and because the, the oral drug can get into the brain and the blood as well also, like the IV can, so that's an ongoing phase three trial um, that really does have the potential to be, you know, as good, if not better than the IV version. But uh, unfortunately, it's a, a large international phase three trial. And I don't think we'll have results probably until 2023. Um, the um, ibutilastin mesitinib, I'll just 
talk a little bit about. They're both anti-inflammatory drugs that are in phase three testing and currently recruiting. Uh, Ibutilast blocks the inflammation in the brain and then mesitinib blocks one of the inf inflammation um, markers in the periphery, in the blood. Um, again, I, I don't know that those will work just uh, as attacking one part of the system, but all these trials do um, are open. You know, obviously, people can take Rilazole. Many of them, at least in the U.S., allow Radicava. So there is a way to get a combination that way. Um, and the last one I'll mention here is this very long name, Lenzumestrocel, uh, which I used to call uh, core stem by the name of the company, but that's actually the name of the drug. And this is another stem cell trial that's very much like uh, the neuron trial. I mean, they have different different ways of treating the cells, but it's a stem cell trial uh, where they take the bone marrow uh, stem cells um, and then um, people get that every eight weeks. And this is only being done in South Korea, but they did register that trial with the US FDA so that if it's a positive phase three trial in South Korea, it could it could be used for filing here. And that trial is currently enrolling. Um, and I think COVID has slowed down enrollment a little bit, but they're still anticipating being done with enrollment 2022 and results in 2023. So that, that's a current, what I would call things closest to market. Um, uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, hopefully 2022 and early 2023, we'll be seeing results of all these uh, late stage trials. Now, there's a lot of other trials going on, um, and uh, this is just a small uh, list of them. And uh, I, um, I'll just say that uh, there's a couple that are very targeted towards the genetic forms of the illness. There's actually three different ways for SOD1 that are in, in development. Two are gene therapies, one is an antibody. There's at least five drugs in, in being um, uh, out there for people with the C9 form of ALS. And there's one um, uh, gene therapy for FUS, which uh, really, uh, which is a genetic form of ALS. Um, and that one really started with an expanded access protocol that, that Dr. Schneider at Columbia did for one of his patients. And then that led to uh, the development of, of, the, of the drug and now a phase three trial that's recruiting globally. But you know, sometimes people ask me about, you know, there's all this research and work being done on the genetic form, but that's only 10% of ALS. You know, what about the other 90%? Now, I'd like to add here, one is that we learn a, a lot from, from the genetic form. We, learn, we develop all the models of the illness, but also the, the approaches used to turn off the gene mutations or turn on things in genetic forms can be used for sporadic disease. For uh, If you know the target that you want to go after, we now have the ability to turn up and turn down genes and proteins of interest, which is really in the brain, which is really like incredible. It's a bit, we would have thought that was science fiction five years ago, uh, but there are marketed drugs now, like for um, a childhood form of motor neuron disease called spinal muscular atrophy with this type of approach. So we do have one trial already in, in um, non-genetic ALS with um, uh, anti-sense algo, which is a type of gene therapy um, against uh, some, a protein called ataxin 2. So when you lower ataxin 2, you get rid of these protein aggregates that we see in the motor neurons of people with ALS. Similarly, if you increase safin 2, you also get rid of them. So there's uh, a, a company, Curalis, uh, that's developing a way to increase uh, safin 2, and then Biogen's working on a way to decrease ataxin 2. And both these gene therapies are targeting the illness for the, the sporadic form. So uh, um, I think those are very exciting scientifically. And um, the taxon one is in phase one, so it's a small study, but it, it should hopefully go into a larger study uh, in 2022. And then there's at least 41 that I could find other kind of phase two studies going on in the world. And I know that uh, IMALS and others have created a nice websites to try to find these trials. I think we need to keep building on that to also have the website of the science. I actually tried to do this and, and realized that starting at six o'clock for a seven o'clock talk on to do this was not a good idea. But so these aren't pretty, but I'll, I'll tell you that, um, you know, we do try to keep track of the trials that are going on in the science. Um, and before I show you the list I came up with that, I'll just also add that besides drugs to try to like slow, slow down the illness or stop the illness, um, there's also uh, technology trials and studies. You just heard of, of one around speech, uh, but 
there are a couple, there's at least three or four communication trials out there. One of them is this with brain gate. This is more of an invasive one, but it's, it's a chip that actually goes into the, uh, the motor cortex and you can control things with your thoughts. And, and several people with ALS have been the pioneers in being part of this study. Um, but, uh, and they are looking for more participants, but there's three other companies with other approaches, including you know the one by Elon uh, Musk, his Neuralinks is working on the approach and two other companies. So I, I do think that um, it's about you know keeping function and repairing function. Um, and along those lines, we're also starting to see some companies working on this idea of repair, uh, of, of how you can um, uh, how you can uh, harness the body's own ability to repair itself, which we know we have. We know that from polio, that people got polio virus, it knocked out some of their motor neurons, and when they cleared the virus, their neuron motor neurons resprouted and regrow, regrew. So there's a couple companies that are working on that. And two of them in particular are, are um, Disarm and Lilly. That, that's a partnership. Um, they're they're um, hopefully going into uh, trials in ALS in 2022. And then uh, Sphingogenics um, also uh, hopefully going into trials in 2022. So I never thought we'd be talking about repair in ALS. So I mean, not not, not never, but I didn't I didn't think it would be that soon. But I, I, we're seeing um, scientists coming to the ALS field from spinal cord injury or stroke repair and trying to think about repair in ALS. So that, that's super exciting. So here are my lists. I'm not going to go through all the drugs, but I, I will, sh obviously you have the slide. I'm happy to share the slides. And we have a scientist in our group, uh, Gaz Sadri Fakili, who actually updates this uh, slide deck monthly. It's about 400 slides. So I didn't, I only pulled out five of them, but um, I'm, I'm, because behind each one of these drugs, we have all the science. I'm, I'm happy to share that with anyone, but these are uh, trials are ongoing with uh, drugs that are already on the on the market for another reason. So, for example, the the uh, group in Edinburgh who is doing their version of a platform trial are testing uh, mark, uh, marketed drugs. So they're repurposing marketed drugs, and they're testing, for example, trazodone and memantine in their um, first platform trial. Um, Prime C is uh, um, uh, two uh, old drugs, uh, a bit like the Amlex story, uh, just different mechanisms, um, Cipro and Celebrox. Um, but anyway, these are some examples. Now, these, you know, the idea behind uh, repurposing FDA drugs is it's faster, you know, because you have all the tax package that you can go straight into um, people. Uh, so it's a much faster approach, um, but you have to actually obviously have good science and good data behind it. Mm -hmm. Then there's a bunch of uh, non, I, I'd say these are more, these are not on the market for any reason. They're experimental drugs. You know, obviously you know about the Amelix and we mentioned uh, some of these, but uh, I'm just gonna show you the list and then share the slides, but it, just really to show you how much activity is going on around the world in ALS. This is another group. Some of them are on the platform trial here, um, but it shows you that people are tackling um, Many different areas. You know, some are going after inflammation. Some are going after um, um, kind of repair. Um, but when I look at these kind of lists, it makes me go back to this idea of combinations. Like I, I worry a little bit about these single uh, approaches, and uh, if if we can um, again uh, maybe learn from other fields about how you can uh, start to combine things to get better, bigger effects. A bit like the Amlet story. Another group, um, a lot of anti-inflammatory type approaches. Anyway, so that's just a partial list. So now, um, I mean, I just wanted to have two or three slides about trial design. I know that there's a lot of interest in not only in, uh, in, in your community, but in all our community uh, to figure out how we can do this better. I, I still think that the main challenge has in the past has been the science and having good drugs. But I do think we have good science and good drugs now. Now we have to think, you know, how can we be more effective and efficient in finding the best ones? And so people have tried different things. So the um, Adarivan and Amalex really tried the approach of, of taking people early in the illness who progressed fast so that in six months you could get an answer, does it work or not? And Neuron tried that as well. And obviously it worked kind of well for the first two and, and uh, not that clear for Neuron. Um, and um, i just say that the, the, there's pros and cons to that. The one is, you know, the, the, the pros are that you can get an answer in six months um, and, and we know, and you can get FDA approval. So that, you know, whenever you have success, everybody copies that success. The, the con, you know, the cons are we, we're left with 
not knowing, does it only work in that population or is this just a good trial design? And also it's really only 7% of the population. So you're excluding most people from trials. So that, that's a big con. So we, we didn't do this approach in the platform trial. But I also think it has some, some risks, you know, that, um, and we, I think we saw that in the first neuron trial that, um, that some drugs might need time. Like for example, in the um, Tafersin trial, which is the SOD1 gene therapy, we saw almost we saw better results in the slower the people who had the mutations associated with the slower course. And it might be that for gene therapy, you need some time to, for it to kick in, and again for that repair process. And so that a six months study in in kind of people with a fast course might you might miss a, a, a positive treatment effect. Um, so I think we have a lot to learn still. And what we don't want to do is, is be cookie cutters. Like we don't want to keep doing the same design. We, we need to be more thoughtful about it and, and really look at the drug and what makes sense for that drug. So um, I'll just end a little bit on a few things about the platform trial. Um, and this is, this is a true partnership with everybody involved in ALS from the patient community to the companies, to the foundations. Um, um, and and um, it's, I think, you know, we'll see when we have the first results, but I, I think it's a success as far as getting off the ground and enrolling well and attracting really good companies and good uh, drugs. Um, uh, just briefly for people who might not have heard about this, this is an approach to um, really accelerate uh, drug development when you have a big pipeline of drugs, which I, I would claim we have a big pipeline of drugs. We have, at my last count, 250 companies in the space. And that's companies that are open about having ALS programs. So they're often companies that are secretive about it for a while. Um, and we can't do one at a time. We'll be here forever. And, and, and so the idea of a platform trial is, is that you build one infrastructure and you keep adding drugs until you find the cures and you start doing combinations and you drop the duds. So you do interim looks every 12 weeks and if something's not working, it, you know, you, you stop it. Um, so nobody's wasting any of their time or precious time and commitment. Um, and this approach saves a lot of money and time. Um, and so the, the efficiencies are because you, when you add a drug, like when we added uh, the fourth regimen, we start with three and then we added fourth, instead of taking a year to do everything to get off the ground, it took uh, less than a month. Um, and uh, same with uh, E um, for the like the approvals for the ethics board and the FDA. And the other efficiency is that you share the placebo group. So here it's three to one. Um, you know, seventy-five percent people get active drug for six months, twenty-five percent placebo. But then you pull all the data from the people on placebo in that six months, and they're used for the current um, treatments, but also for the future ones. And there's ways statistically to make sure that you can still do that. And ideally you can start to lower, you know, change that ratio over time too. Um, uh, I don't know if we can get rid of it, but that we're, you know, the goal is to get it as, as small as possible. So um, you know, we, when we started to think about this from day one, we had uh, an amazing advisory group from people with ALS, but we also met, um, from the beginning to the FDA. And I'll just say that they were enormously helpful um, from, from the beginning on this and enthusiastic about this. And we met with the companies because if they weren't interested, this wasn't gonna go very far, but they were very interested. And obviously with our, um, our, found, our foundations. The other efficiency we brought to this was to use a, a one single um, uh, review board. So usually in trials, every hospital, their ethics board reviews it. And that can take an enormous amount of time and, and, and you get very different answers. When I used to do the 60 centers, I would have 60 different ethics reviews, um, ranging from, you know, one that approved it in one day and one that refused to approve it. So there's not a commonality there. So we, we really built this system to have one, one, um, one review. And again, that saves enormous time. You can also learn in this, like uh, you want to learn if the drugs work, but you can develop other outcome measures, which we, we all know we desperately need. Um, and we do have a speech in there and you can have fluid biomarkers. And we know again, in oncology, that's how they develop their shorter surrogate markers by building them into their platform trials. So we're trying to do that as well. So these are our current five drugs. Um, and uh, the, the fifth one is just being added now. And we anticipate uh, first enrollment in January with screening of, in December, mid December. Um, so the, the, um, the first four we picked as a global competition, um, uh, what we thought were the best drugs out there. Um, 
is a leukoplan is com complement inhibitor. So it, it, it works differently than the Lexion one. Uh, it gets into the brain. Uh, so it blocks inflammation both in the periphery and the brain. Brain Verdipostat is a, um, uh, it works on uh, these uh, cells called microglia, which we think to help uh, are activated and spread the illness. So that blocks that activation. CNMAU8 um, helps with uh, cellular energy. And predopidine uh, uh, has many different mechanisms, uh, actually, but one of them that we were particularly interested in is it blocks something called a nuclear pore leakage, where the genetic material is in the wrong part of the cell, and, and we think that might be an upstream um, problem in, in, in people with ALS. And trilose, the most recent, blocks uh, uh, the, the, a pathway important for how uh, the motor neurons uh, do die, so it's a way to, to prevent that. And I'm very excited that we're talking to, um, we have at least two other companies lined up and, and uh, we've probably talked about 60 companies, but we have two that are very close to, uh, to join in 2022 as well. We have uh, 52 centers, we're adding uh, 20 more um, just to get more geography. I, there's always a hole, I'm sorry if anyone's from Montana or Wyoming, there aren't a lot of centers there, but, but we, need, uh, we need to do that, but uh, we're trying to expand more. So we finished enrollment in the first three, and we're just so excited about that because that means we know when we're going to have uh, the results, which will be um, next summer. I just say that that the data is reviewed every 12 weeks by an independent committee to do what we call futility analysis, and that's what I talked about, about removing the duds. So they, if something's not working and has no chance of working, it would be stopped. Um, and, and I think every trial should do that. The, the fourth regimen is about to be done. Um, I think we're, we have, um, a few, we're, we're actually reopening it for enrollment for a few more uh, participants, um, uh, but I think it'll be uh, finished enrollment in December. And uh, about almost 300 people have finished the, the um, 24 weeks and gone into the open label extension where they're absolutely getting the, uh, getting the drug. Um, so it's, um, and this, again, thanks to everybody here and, and the, all the people in this trial, we wouldn't be able to do this without you. And we did this in the pandemic, um, which I think, again, was not easy, but the good lessons about how to, how to do things in the home and more efficiently as well. Um, Allison, I think many of you know, and Catherine are our, our navigators, and they're really there to answer questions and help people, not just about the platform trial, but really about any trial. Um, and they are uh, get lots of calls, and I think it's it, it was uh, it was actually our patient advisory committee's idea to have this role, and uh, it's it's been fantastic. I think other companies now and other trials are are, are adapting this model as well. Um, the other idea that the uh, committee asked us to do is to build a companion expanded access program for people who are not eligible for the trial, and even though we made our criteria much broader than. Um, for example, the Amalex and the Neuron and the Daravone study. So we wanted to get a, a, a broader population. It, there's still about half the people with ALS who are not eligible for this particular trial. Um, so, um, and I'm not sure that we completely addressed it with these initial EAPs, but we at least got it off the ground and got the discussion. Thanks to, again to, to many of you uh, with companies that that they should do this. You know, a lot of companies don't want to have a companion um, uh, compassion use program this early in their drug development because they're worried about you know, what if there's a side effect or what if something happens, but really there's no company that's ever gone out of business because of an expanded access program. So uh, we have uh, launched the first two, uh, Biohaven um, uh, and the Clean Expanded Access and the Perennial one is gonna start uh, uh, in the next two or three weeks. We almost have everything in place for that. Um, and of course, we're asking CELOS to do this as well, and we're really telling people, all companies up front that this is part of being part of the platform trial so that we can eventually expand this to other centers. I kind of mentioned um, Madeline. Um, Madeline uh, inspired me to start the EAP program uh, you know, at our center, and Ellen here too. Um, and Again, this, this the idea here is uh, these are this is about providing access to people who can't be in trials and with the same drugs that are in trials. And we started this at Mastro a couple of years ago. I just want to show these are all the ones that we've done. They range in size from just for one you know one person to, to up to forty. And any physician can do this. I mean, it, it does take you have to have some infrastructure and some and the time to do it. But any physician can ask a company to provide a drug, especially for a single person. 
uh, the, the ones that are a little bigger uh, might it take a little bit more uh, negotiating, but we've actually enrolled 147 people in our expanded access, including people who've you know, had the illness 10 years or been told many times it could be in the trial. Um, so it, it's very, um, it's very rewarding. And um, again, that was inspired uh, from Madeline on this and I'm really happy we're doing it. And I, and I just have seen the dialogue change um, it, at uh, with my colleagues that they they want to also start this at their centers um, and so we're uh, with, the, with Rick Badlack at Duke we're putting together materials to try to make that easy for people and streamlined uh, so so that people don't have to reinvent the wheel and can learn from what what we've learned and what what other groups have learned. So I'll just end and say um, that um, the. the I think this platform trial approach is is a really good way we should be doing this not just in ALS but in other neurological illnesses you know we'll adapt and hopefully we'll get to combinations and, and we'll figure out if six months is the right duration or it should be longer or shorter um, we'll have the results for the first four um, next summer um, we're launching the fifth uh, we're, we're very close on the sixth one and uh, we're hoping basically to add two or three a, a year to this um, and hopefully there'll be other groups that do other platform trials. There doesn't need to be one, one platform trial. We've seen that already in Europe that they're starting, uh, they've started one. Um, and um, we're just all sharing information so people uh, can work together on this. So uh, I'll maybe end there and see if I can uh, have time for questions. I'm sure we have a ton of questions and we're actually gonna have um, Sarah Diaz from our Everything ALS team to moderate them. And we'll probably have a student on, so I'll let you do that introduction. But thank you so much, Merritt. It's always wonderful to have you on. And you guys are really paving the way. You're touching a lot of lives now, and you're going to really make a difference for the future of ALS. And we are forever grateful for that. And you do not get the name um, the godmother of ALS for no reason. So thanks for all you do. But Sarah, I'll let you take it away and get all those questions answered. Sounds good. Thank you, Lisa. Um, like she said, my name is Sarah. I'm one of the Everything ALS team members. Um, I lost my dad in 2018 to ALS and um, am thrilled to get to work with this team every day and, and uh, be here with you again. I don't know if you remember from the last time, probably not. <laughs> but um, we will get started. We do have a student ambassador. Her name's Casey. She will also be moderating with me. So you get to the two for one special. Uh, our first question, and you kind of answered it. So I, I apologize, but if there's anything else to add, that'd be great. Um, what can maybe current ALS patients that are on this call be able to do to help um, with the research and help move it forward? Is there anything active that they can do besides just participating in trials? Uh there's so much to do, and I, thank you for that question. I think uh, you mentioned one, obviously being part of, of um, trials, but I think there's other ways to, um, it doesn't have to be a trial, it could be an observational study, whether it's like the, the speech uh, thing that you're doing or giving DNA or blood, I, I, or just you're allowing your clinical data to be used. I know there's a big initiative, Bob Hebron and, and others in Sandy are leading to see if we can collect natural history data from everybody that's going to clinic. So giving that kind of permission or maybe, um, you know, asking your neurologist to do that. Um, um, advocacy, uh, I mean, I, I, I am just blown away by the advocacy. I mean, I, I, I've been in the field a long time. It's not been this way. And, and people used to say, you know, it's, it's hard to do it. There's so much going on, but you managed to do it and it made, it made a big impact. Thank you. So the second question we have is, what are your thoughts on investigating the reversal cases from the research at Duke University? Yeah, I think, first of all, we have to do it. I mean, it's that you learn so much from, um, I guess, in a way what nature has done. I mean, the, the fact that people get better, we, we need to learn as much as we can. And um, I think you don't know what you need to look for. So you have to look really broadly. Um, and I'll, I'll just give an example from HIV that you know they, they've, there's been some recent papers this year that they finally figured out why uh, there are some people who, who uh, don't get ill. Um, and and um, now I don't think it's gonna take us as long as it took them because you know, the, they didn't have the technology to do what they've done now, but they found you know, genetic changes that basically prevented these people from getting infected. And, 
I think we need to do the same, and that's what Rick is trying to do. But whether it's going to be in the history or what people take or their uh, approach to things or in their genes, I think we just don't know. So collecting as much information as possible. And I, you know, if I was a funding organization, I would fund that because I think that's really important. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, can you kind of broadly discuss why the process for new therapies takes so long? What is um, kind of the reason for that almost not delay, but that slow initiation? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think there's a couple uh, like roadblocks to drug development. Um, and um, one of them is that, that the requirement that of, of the, the safety data you need to do in, in animals before you can get to people is huge. And if you're not a Biogen or a Lily or an Novartis, you don't have those, um, those resources. And many of those 250 companies are small companies. Uh, I mean, there are certainly the large ones in ALS, but I'd say the majority are small. And so they spend an enormous amount of time fundraising for uh, the money just to do those pivotal studies. And um, I know that the ALS Association is trying to fill that gap. They just did a, a call for grants for that, but you know, they'll fund five. You know, there's like 200. Um, and the Department of Defense is trying, but that, that's the number, I think that's the first poll. That, that needs to be filled in it. You know, the venture capitalists, I guess, don't want to fund it because it's too risky or it's not exciting to fund th that part of it. Uh, they all want to wait until you're, you have data and people. Mm -hmm. So that's one the gap that, you know, the years could be shaved off by figuring out how to at least do it for the, the top 10 or 20. Or, um, and then I think that there's, you know, there's this traditional model of, you know, phase one, phase two, phase three, and long gaps between them. Um, and I think there's opportunities there to, um, I guess, uh, again, be, be more adaptive so that you don't have these big gaps between your stages of trials. So those are two areas. Yeah, thank you. Could you please explain why clinical trials are always designed to utilize people who are newly diagnosed and not people who have had ALS for a long time? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I, I don't, now that's what I was also kind of alluding to. I'm not sure that that's always the best way. It's 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 a, a very common in, in pharma that if, if somebody has a success, that the next ten trials are that exact same way. Um, so there was a success with the Derivome, you know, where they found that in their first study they found that it worked seemed to only that it worked better in people early in the illness, so that they they uh, repeated it in that population and got success. Um, I think there's a I think it, 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 these designs should be driven by the science. Like if you know that, that the target that your drug is going after is most relevant early, then that's what you should do. But if it's present elsewhere, then, then I think you should be broader. Um, but I, I, think that it's, I think it's being driven by kind of because you, they've seen a success. We appreciate you having that opinion on it. Um, the next question is, can you talk briefly about what your thoughts as to the cause for ALS or maybe the contributors, the major ones that you consider? Yeah, such a good question. I, I, and and I, uh, it's, it's still hard to believe that we don't know the answer to this question other than the, you know, the genetic form. Um, I, th I think it's, a, um, I believe that this paper from Amar al Shalabi in UK where they, they, they modeled how many things have, happen to someone in their lifetime to get to ALS. And it's about six things that have to happen to you. Um, and so and those six things can be different in, in each person, which is, I think, why we haven't figured out the real cause. Like, we don't have anything like smoking and lung cancer. There's no uh, really high risk factor, but there's all these small ones. And if you only get three of them, you're not going to get ALS. And so, um, so I do think that... Um, there's something about athletes, you know, whether it's whatever makes you able to be an athlete is the risk factor or the actual exercise. I, I think we don't, we can't tease that apart, but that seems to be a, a you know, common risk factor. And also uh, I think smoking, but, but none of these are huge. Um, 
and I do think there's probably things in the environment. You know, there are there are more um, people around certain lakes, um, and, and there's certainly more farmers or pilots. So there, there's a like a sense that there's something in the environment, but again, it's probably not enough um, just to have you know one of these. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The next question is, can you speak a little bit more about Prime C and if it will become available to patients? Yeah, I, I like I like the science. I, for full disclosure, I think I'm on their science board and might have options. Um, you know, anyway, so just uh, to declare that. Um, so they it's um it's a combination drug of ciprofloxacin and celebrex so cipro is, is an antibiotic but they're they're not using it for as an antibiotic they they were screening for drugs that helped uh repair um how proteins are made from your genetic code um something called rna metabolism um and they they actually found the whole class of antibiotics uh like cipro so there's ciprofloxacin and oxo Anoxifen, they all worked really well in their models. And then they tried to add combinations to see if they could get better effects. And they found that low dose of Celebrex uh, mm -hmm. improved the ciprofloxacin effect. So, so that's their combination. And they've, they've done, uh, they've tested the different models of the disease in, in animal models. And then they did an open label study in Israel with I think 15 people. Where just compared to at least to natural history, you know, they 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 saw some some um, some you know hints of, of success, um, and and their plan. But again, this is an example of, of the you know the delays, right? So this is a small company, um, you know, one drug going after ALS, trying to raise money um, to to get to the next step. Um, this question is a little more specific. What are your thoughts on removing metal from your mouth or chelation or other therapies to kind of remove those toxins? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I'd say that big picture, we really don't know, but I, I, I typically don't recommend it. I mean, uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that I do think there, um, when we're talking about risk factors, there's something about trauma as a risk factor, uh, whether that's physical trauma or emotional trauma. And I worry about the trauma of removing all your you know, kind of metal. Um, it's not a, not a minor thing. Um, but also there's been a lot of metal studies and they don't really pan out as abnormal in people with ALS. And the challenge is, is how you measure it. If you measure in blood, you're just measuring like what you ate in the last day or two. If you measure in urine, it's like maybe the last two or three weeks, you really have to go into hair or or bone. And when they do good studies of that, the only thing that's really been found is, is in bone. I think there's a little elevation in iron and lead, but nothing, the mercury thing hasn't really had that. Interesting. Are there any treatments for ALS caused by recessive OPTN gene causing RIPK1 enzyme excess? Oh, I might have to uh, read that. Uh, uh, I might have to say, well, I'll just answer the recessive one and then you might, I might need you to repeat the gene. The, there, are, um, there are some recessive mutations. Uh, they're not very common, but there's uh, one, it's called ALS2. Um, uh, and also it tends to cause a juvenile or young onset. And then I think now there's some thoughts about optineurin might be recessive, but there, most of the genetics are uh, what we call dominant, which means that you only need one copy of the gene mutation from like one side of the family to, to, um, to be at risk for the illness. Um, specifically chest physical therapy vests, do they work well in ALS? And uh, when, if they do, would you recommend starting to use them? I do think they, they work really well. Uh, um, I was actually really impressed by, I, I wasn't using them until I saw somebody really get a lot of benefit from it, the, the, their pulmonologist put them on it. I, I think it helps uh, um, really get the, the, the deeper secretions up. Um, and some people find that more comfortable than the cough assist. So I, I, I usually recommend at least trying, you know, you can try one or both and see what works best for you. Um, but I think I don't think we pay enough attention to good pulmonary care um, and, and, and that we should be doing it from day one rather than when somebody has symptoms. So, um, so you, even that chest thing, if it keeps your kind of airways clean and, and prevents infections and, and, and gets oxygen exchange, it's a good thing. 
Could you please discuss the Phoenix trial and Alexia drug and the Courage trial? Yes. Yeah. So the Phoenix trial, I guess I should put that one on my slide. That's a good point. The Phoenix trial is a repeat study of the Amlex drug. So when, um, so the, uh, when in the initial conversations with the FDA, there was a desire for a second study that was larger and longer because the, the original trial was only six months and 137 people. And also uh, the European regulatory agencies wanted longer and more. So it, it is a trial of the same dose of uh, the Tudka sodium phenobutrate as was used in the, um, the first study of AMX0035, but the study is longer and it's in about 600 people and it's, it's a global study. Um, and it will be important for, I mean, I, I, I don't think we need, I know we don't need to wait for those results to get the FDA decision on the um, FDA approval of AMX035. But I do think for the field, it'll, it would be important to have those results because we'll know and then we'll know if it's real, you know, because sometimes small studies can be wrong. Um, and then we'll also see a longer, you know, the effect uh, for a longer period of time. The Courage one is uh, with the uh, uh, deceptive. So this is a drug by Cytokinetics. Um, and this drug um, also works directly on the muscles and helps muscles contract more efficiently. It's it's different than the levosimendin one uh, that I mentioned uh, that, that didn't work. It has a, 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 a different part of the muscle that it works on. And they have some phase two data. So earlier phase study of, of uh, a positive effect of breathing function. So they're doing a phase three trial to kind of confirm that finding. And obviously they're looking also at, at other, other muscles uh, for strength effects. Um, you've spoken about the combination medications and, and kind of ut utilizing the Healy trial to um, do that research, but how will we know what combinations to put together? What does that process of coming up with those combinations look like? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I, I don't have all the answers, but I would think that, um, so like in the, in the platform trial, what we would do if any of them is positive, hopefully they'll all be positive, but let's say one of them is then we would add that one. And ideally, that's what you do in the platform trial. Then it becomes everybody on, on, always gets that one, um, and then plus a new one. So you start to build those combinations. Um, but if you don't know up, up front that, you, I think you, I would do it based on the biology. Like you, if we think uh, the nuclear pore, you know, this leakage of the DNA is important. You know, you want a drug that works on that. If you think inflammation is important, you want to add that, right? So you want to try to get drugs that target different parts of the biology. You'll probably have to do some you know, studies to make sure they don't interfere with each other's metabolism and they're reasonably safe to give together, but those aren't very long or expensive preclinical studies. And uh, just said we are doing com combinations so we, because people can be on Rilazole, they can be on the Daravone. As soon as AMX0035 is on the market, it can be on that, oh. plus the new drug. So we, we are kind of starting to get there. Wonderful, thank you. What is the thought or science behind a dopamine inhibitor? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So um, there, there is some, there's some data that that um, that would help as a, more like as an antioxidant effect. Um, it's not like it's not a huge body of literature on that in ALS, but there's at least some suggestions mm -hmm. that might help um, decrease kind of uh, oxidative toxicity. Uh, specifically to the Healy trial, why is a history of cancer an exclusion factor? Ah, that's a good question. So it's not all cancers, but it's cancers in the recent um, in the recent couple of years. And and the reason is really um, you know uh, in case uh, some cancer comes back that it just it, it, it uh, complicates the ability to tell if the drug is working. So it's not a necessarily unique to the Healy platform trial. It's, it's pretty much every clinical trial has that. But for example, if um, if it's uh, like skin cancers are excluded, you know, but more benign cancers are are excluded. And if it was a cancer someone had, you know, five years ago, it's 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 that's okay. It's just more recent. Um, which drugs have you decided to drop, and which have you decided to continue? Um, that have been in the Healy platform trial? That's a really great question. So the good news is none of them have, have uh, failed uh, the futility test uh, or they, they haven't, none of them have been dropped, but we've had uh, three, three interim looks. 
So we start to look after 40 people have finished at least six months on a regimen because you have to have enough data to be able to say something. And then once that happens, it's every 12 weeks. Well, the first three regimens have been looked at um, three times already and, and, and passed, uh, meaning that they have not uh, been deemed futile. So they haven't been dropped. And the more data you have, the higher, you know, the more confidence you have on that. Um, um, the big ticket question, where are your thoughts on a reliable biomarker? And uh, do you perceive that this will be coming hopefully soon for ALS? Oh my, well, I have to say that before I saw the, the SOD1 to first results, I really thought we were gonna have it with our the neurofilament, the light, which again, that, and I still think we might have it with that, but that was disappointing that, that, that this again is a marker of a neural injury and we know it's higher in people who have a faster course. Um, and then it's, and also we know that it elevates right before you get symptoms. We know that from the genetic form. So, and then it's stable over time for the most part. So that drug really lowered neurofoma. It just didn't have a robust clinical uh, uh, association. So I think we're, we're not back to square one, but I think um, we don't quite have the answer. It might be that it's going to be more than one biomarker. It's going to be like some, you know, a, a biomarker of inflammation, one of TBP43, but we need to solve that. Any every field that's found a surrogate marker, which means a marker that changes in like two months and predicts clinical outcome, has seen just uh, a huge number of drugs come to the market. So uh, it's it's well worth trying to trying to figure it out. What is the process with drug approval in other countries, such as can they be presented to the FDA in the U.S. for approval? Yeah, so if, if a drug, I mean, if a drug, um, if the study was done well in another country, it can be acceptable uh, uh, in the U.S. So uh, Derivo was a good example of that, that it was only tested in Japan, but and that data was used for approval here. And the same for the course, then, if, that, if that's positive in South Korea, it can be used here. Um, you know, sometimes the other is, it's not true the other way around. Sometimes uh, drugs approved in the U.S. have to be tested in that population, like in China or Japan, but but our FDA has been open to that. Um, the next question is also about the Healy trial. Will the regimen four or D, sorry, will regimen D also have an open label extension? Yes, they all have open label extensions. That's uh, re required. So after six months, uh, and uh, now we, we got all the companies to, to um, agree that people continue on the open label until we know the results of that arm. And then obviously if it's positive, they it can continue. Initially, uh, some of the smaller companies didn't have the resources to commit to that the entire duration, but they did at least six months, but now they've all committed for the entire part. That's great. Will Amelex be available for those on ventilators? That is a really good question. I, I hope so. I would, I would plan, I personally will plan to prescribe it for them, but, I, but well, whether Insurance will cover that or not is another story. I don't think I don't think we know that, but I know there's work being done to um, you know talk to insurance companies and start to tie it up that way. And now we know that we I mean hopefully we won't have to advocate for that, but and, and now we know that we have the right groups to advocate for things like that. Well, I've got one more question for you. I know there are a ton of questions still left in the chat, but we do want to respect your time, and we're coming up on an hour, so. Um, I want to know what pushes you and gives you the most hope for the future of ALS treatment. Um, a couple things, but uh, I'd say that the um, the community engagement uh, is is just I, I, I haven't seen it like this you know ever, and 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 that gives me a lot of hope because there's a lot of it's like we're moving in sync, um, and so that gives me a lot of hope. And then the, the other really is just the sheer number of brilliant scientists in this field uh, that, you know, we, that weren't there before. So, um, and the pace of discoveries gives me a lot of hope. Good. I'll tell you I what would... that worries me though. Okay, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, all, we want both sides. I like the honesty. <laughs> um, and it's, it's affecting all the, the um, all fields, right? Um, uh, it's great resignation. We, we are seeing a lot of, a lot of nurses leave the field, a lot of coordinators, and a lot of doctors go into industry. And I worry about um, where's our young generation of brilliant minds, you know, um, 
but but um, anyway, there, I'm, I'm, I hope this is just a temporary thing for the next year or two, but I worry a little bit about that. I, we here, I'll just say like the, the platform trial told showed us that if if you work as a partner with with the community, you can you can enroll in trial really fast because that was another barrier before. Now the sites are the barriers, right? They don't have the staff and the people to do it. That worries me, especially uh, you know, with, with kind of this people leaving their jobs, but we'll, we'll get through it. Uh, we've had tougher problems to solve. Well, there you go, Casey. We gotta, we gotta pull up the reins. Three more years and I'll graduate. There you <laughs> uh, go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, on that note, we want to thank you so much for your time. This again has been a wonderful presentation. I know we've had so many questions answered and there's so many people here the whole time listening and really it's just so impressive and great to hear all that you have to share and say, and we always are thrilled to hear from you. So um, from all of us at Everything ALS and everybody on this call, thank you so much. Mm -hmm.